The Genuine Article. Discussion and commentary based on articles from Jack. Hello, I'm Tony DeMaria, the editor of Jack, and I'm here again with Dr. David Son, and David is a well-known pediatric cardiologist specialist in congenital heart disease, and we're talking about the recently released ACCAHA guidelines on the adult with congenital heart disease. David, there is a number of specific uh, issues that the guidelines focus on. One of the soci psychosocial needs, they're particularly acute in these patients, aren't they? Well, they're acute and chronic. I mean, a, a number of them um, can be depressed because they've had lifelong health problems. Some of them have had a poor school performance. Some of them have had difficulty finding work. Um, remember, these are kids that grew up with serious congenital heart disease as a major medical problem. Now as adults, they sometimes have problems getting insurance because they have a prior medical condition. Sure, and these psychosocial stresses affect not only the, uh, the patient, but their families who grappled with these while they were children. Another issue that the guidelines uh, address is pregnancy on the part of adults with congenital heart disease. Uh, it's associated with increased risk, uh, both to the patient and perhaps for uh, the sibling, uh, uh, the child having congenital heart disease. So what are the recommendations there? Well, it, it, they vary. I mean, for instance, for women with pulmonary hypertension, Pregnancy is really contraindicated. The risks are very high for maternal death during pregnancy. So those women need to be counseled for birth control and prevention of pregnancy. For women that have volume-loaded conditions, like aortic regurgitation, for instance, the volume load of pregnancy requires special management of the pregnancy itself and of the delivery. And then there are risks to the unborn baby, the recurrence risk, for women with certain kinds of congenital heart disease or for men conceiving uh, a child who have congenital heart disease, the risks in the fetus are not insignificant for certain conditions. So it's really important that uh, these patients be counseled about the issues uh, relating in and about pregnancy. And one of the common issues that confronts the adult cardiologist is a patient uh, who is an adult and has an atrial septal defect that's been present since birth, and perhaps the patient's doing pretty well. And the issue is, when do you go ahead and close those, and when do you assume that since they haven't caused uh, any difficulties with the patient that they ought to be just left alone? Well, for an asymptomatic patient with an ASD, most of those patients have done relatively well, but they usually have right heart enlargement, and they usually have fibrotic changes that make them prone to arrhythmia. And so, so patients with ASD who then go into atrial flutter or fibrillation have an increased embolic risk. And most people would think that a simple ASD, even in a relatively asymptomatic patient, should probably be closed. And I think the guidelines recommend if there's right atrial, right ventricular enlargement, even in the absence of any symptoms at all, they should be closed. I suspect with these new closure devices, that's uh, even a bit less of an issue. Well, it may be, but then again, there's, there's the potential that having a foreign body uh, placed in the atrial septum to close a defect might increase the potential risk for arrhythmias, but this is another area where we don't really have hard evidence. We don't know a lot about it. Yeah, and I guess uh, the last issue that was really focused upon was patients with tetralogy of Fallot. These, these patients uh, really do need close follow-up, don't they? They do. They usually have pulmonary regurgitation in the area of the right ventricular outflow tract that was resected they can become symptomatic with atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. All of this really points out the need for a combination of people of different expertise to get together and provide a multidisciplinary environment to give the best chance of proper care. 
Yeah, well, there's no, no question that uh, again and again the document comes back to emphasizing the needs of comprehensive centers of excellence with uh, multiple specialties uh, working side by side and lending their expertise. Uh, it's a valuable document. I, I think it's one that we all ought to read and consider greatly. For the Genuine Article, I'm Tony DeMaria. Have a question or comment about a CBN story? Send us an email at cbnfeedback at acc.org.